am I allowed to speak on this one? show drive with myself and VM. Um, interesting weather this morning, cloudy, very overcast and quite cool. So I wonder, I wonder, it's going, looks like it's going to be an interesting day. We'll see what we can find. This morning, Brent is out with me on the vehicle, and later James will be doing bushwalk, I believe. So that should be fun. And what else? That's it. Did you sleep all, Vim? Yes. Really? Good. Vim says he slept well. I didn't. Sure. Oh well. <laughs> so I just. <laughs> <laughs> I had a spider crawling on me last night, but it was big enough that it actually woke me up. That's <laughs> it. I think it was a little baby baboon spider. It was about this big, but I could feel it crawling on my leg. And I woke up and it was so quick and it came around my arm and, <laughs> and then disappeared off the side of the bed. So that kept me awake for a little while afterwards, obviously, because once it disappeared, I didn't know where it went. Not ideal. <laughs> Rebecca says it sounds scary. Wasn't that scary, but just, uh, you know, you just don't like things crawling on you when you're sleeping at night. It's not ideal. That's it. light so I'm not sure what our plan for this morning is going to be yet I think I'm going to head over to Cheetah Plains um, and uh, possibly have a look around there hold on Brent's calling me good morning Brent go ahead I'm just doing a quick loop around quarantine quickly, um, but then I'm going to take uh, probably Twin Dams Road and head straight down to the uh, to the boundary and head towards Cheetah Plains. Okay, copy. I will do. Brent is trying to have a look for Karula, it sounds like. That seemed like a very quick five minute pre show show. Sure all the little lambs running around already. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to South Africa in the middle of the bush as we search for Africa's animals live. This is Safari Live. Ready? Standing by. One, you are live, you are live. 
morning, morning, and welcome to a slightly clouded, cloudy, not clouded. Oh, I suppose it could be clouded, Juma Private Game Reserve. My name is Brent Leo Smith, and of course, on the back with me is uh, my good friend Brian and the Thumb. As you will th see, it's Monday. The Thumb is wearing a blue tie for the Monday Blues. But if you look more closely, the Thumb has a smile because. Who needs Monday blues when you live in the bush? But it's great to have you with us on our live African safari. We are in search of Karula, the female leopard, and her two cubs. I've checked where we found them yesterday, and alas, they have scoffed, gobbled, and swallowed the baby impala, and they've moved off. So we're trying to find some tracks to find out which direction they moved off, and uh, it is quite nice to be a bit cool this morning. Yesterday was an absolute scorcher, uh, a sauna of a day, and it sat between, I think the heat of the day got over 100, 102, 103, and then by the time Sunset Safari started, it was 99. So, but we did have lots of fun on the Sunday, and I hope you guys enjoyed the fireside chat. All the fire, uh, we didn't have a fire, of course, this day. There was no need. Uh, just being inside the tent that's been in the sun all day was the equivalent to sitting inside a fire. I was going to say inside a boiling witch's cauldron was what I was going for. So it was very warm in that tent, uh, but it was wonderful to have you there and, and quite, quite a happy story to end off the white muscle disease that the Nkumas are now up an atom, so to speak, and the cubs are making a miraculous recovery, and so have the adults. Now, where did Karula go? Now, I'm pretty sure she didn't come up here. I'm pretty sure she's headed further down to the east, but one must make sure that she hasn't gone this way first, and then we work our way down to where she, we think she might be. There's also a very strong possibility that Karula is just lounging on the edge of quarantine, waiting for a poor unsuspecting a baby impala to meander towards the edge and where she will pounce. And uh, we're gonna go see that area a bit later. I just wanna make sure she hasn't gone further to the west. But of course, I'm not the only one out and about. So let's go say good morning to Byron. Good morning everyone, um, my name is Byron and with me on camera this morning is VM. And, and it's a pity Karula has moved off but it was a small impala lamb so a female leopard like that will finish that quite quickly especially with those two hungry cubs. Um, but I'm going to give Brent a quick little hand and just see if we don't see tracks of her moving anywhere. But then my plan for this morning is to head over to Cheetah Plains. I haven't been down there for quite a while. Um, so I'm interested to go have a look around and perhaps, if we are lucky, maybe see some cheetah or who knows what this morning holds for us. I'm just having a good look around here. I don't want to miss tracks if Brent is looking for Karula while I'm driving towards Cheetah Plains. It's a very nice, cool morning. I like these mornings, overcast, much better than yesterday. Yesterday was so hot yesterday afternoon, it really was. see what we can find. I'm hoping we get to see some elephant today. That would be wonderful. I haven't really seen much elephant around this this stint that I've been here in the last two or three weeks. Just trying to scan very very carefully and have a look for any signs of leopard tracks. Or anything for that matter, who knows? Maybe the Unkahuma Pride is around somewhere, I'm not sure where they have been. Bless you here. <laughs> I can 
here. I was at a laughing dove that I could hear calling in the distance. The birds are calling. There's a long-billed crombeck. The tree, 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 tree. It was calling. Tiny little bird with almost no tail. Let me see if I can find a picture of one quickly for you. Beautiful bird. They, they um, not very colourful, but they, they they've got a wonderful call and very interesting shape. But difficult to to see actually but they've got quite a distinct call the long billed crombeck let's see if i can find it there we go and it's that little guy over there look at that beautiful little long billed crombeck that would that's what I could hear calling. But they are small and they jump in and around little bushes. It's not easy to see them. Roger, you say you'd like to see wild dog and hyena. Well, let's let's see. Let's see. You never know. You never know. I'd also like to see wild dog. Um, trying to think now. I've only seen wild dog once since I've been working with the wild earth. Um, yeah, I've only seen them once, so it would be great to see them again. Yesterday, myself and VM didn't have much luck on the vehicle. We were searching and searching. We, <laughs> we just couldn't really find much. But perhaps today is different. And it's good. I think um, days like that keep us humble. Well, I haven't seen any tracks, unfortunately, while I've been driving along here. Um, so let's head back to Brent, get an update from him and see if he's had any luck. So we're slowly heading towards the north down Philemon's cut line. Now, the wonderful thing about walking with some of the different guys out here, and uh, Brian and I were lucky enough to walk with Aubrey, Yes, and Aubrey's been here for 27 years, so he's got this incredible wealth of knowledge just on Juma and the surrounding areas. And uh, I mean, we drive down here, and I've always assumed Philemon's named after someone, and so I was like, Well, Aubrey, where's Philemon's come from? And Aubrey starts, he's a very, very, very funny man, but takes a while to get to know. So then he goes, Oh, oh, starts laughing. And was after an old tractor driver, but he was old already then, so he must have been very old. And uh, apparently he was quite a cant cant cantankerous old old guy. Oh, no. And he used to drive the tractor and maintain the roads. But if he decided he was tired, he could have 20 guys out for the day to be working with them, doing stuff. He would just park the tractor in the shade and, and swear at them and tell them all to go away and have a sleep. So, and apparently he was a massive character and, 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 and grew up on, on Juma. So there we go. And those of you who ever wondered what, where Philemon's, Philemon's cut line comes from, it comes from Philemon, uh, the cantankerous tractor driver. So there are not too many names of roads out here that bear the names of people. So the only other two I can think of are Rebecca's and Zoe's Road. And that's, of course, 
uh, Yuri and Pippa's daughters. So, uh, rightly so, they have roads named after them. Oh, sorry, Emerald Spotted Wood Dove. I didn't mean to give you a fright within an inch of your life while you're still dozing. It was sitting up in the tree, and as we went past, he was like, Oh, what's that? Off you went. Remember, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to ask us anything about what's happening out here in the African bush. Now, with that wind last night, it's going to make. I'm pretty sure actually they would have moved after the wind, that, or the leopards that is, so there's a good chance that the tracks are not going to be completely obliterated, but this light does make one strain the eyes slightly. Well, it's a good start for Byron in comparison to, yes to yesterday. It seems like he's found a creature, so let's go see which one. It is indeed. Now we've got a group of Inyala, but they're two males, and they're displaying against one another. There's the male on the bottom left there. The other one has just moved off, but look at how he's raised that mane on his back. And they're doing that beautiful Inyala... Um, dominance dance, really, is what they were doing. And they've just split up, unfortunately. And <laughs> the Inyala moving through there. Look at that young Inyala, that is beautiful. There's a nice group of Inyala. A lot of females watching, watching these two males displaying and challenging each other. And it looks like that one that we saw move off to the left, and you can just see his horns there. I think he won, because the other one has moved off. Hang on there, he's coming back out into the open. Sorry, there. let's see if he does it again. No, but look how that, he's now relaxed that mane. It's not standing up as much as it was earlier. He's walking a lot quicker. They do that very, very slow walk. Where's he going? I'd like to just have a look and see if that other male pops out again. Maybe they display for us again. So what they do is they do that circular dance almost around one another. They move very, very slowly, lift their legs up, put that mane up, and they, they, um, they, they've got this wonderful posture that they do, and then they, and this posturing, and trying to intimidate the other one and drive the other one away. Let's see, I think I can see them coming through off to the left. Here we go, here we go, hold on. Yes, they, they're doing that display now a little bit. Look, oh, wonderful. See, he, he lowers his head, straightens his legs, lifts them very slowly. See if the other one responds. This is fantastic. This is really a great start. Um, now, usually it's only the displaying. And Sammy Soccer, I was about to answer your question. Very good question. You asked, um, do they dance as opposed to fight? Now, Sammy Soccer, they. Um, they, they do usually just do this display and, uh, and try and intimidate one another. Let me just move forward for you for a second. Now, usually they just do this display and they dance and they try and intimidate one another. However, I have seen Inyala fight before and it's, I mean, it's actually quite, quite violent. They're very, very powerful antelope, believe it or not. Wow, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? That slow movement, lowering the head, raising that mane on the back. 
Sometimes I even f um, flick the tail up. This is really, really great. It would be amazing if we did get a fight live. That would be really, really interesting to see. Um, and see, the other one isn't really displaying as much. If you have a look there, let's see if he starts doing it now. We're definitely challenging one another. It's incredible how slowly they move. See how he drops that head down. He's trying to show the horns off a little bit. Show that big mane. Look at those slow steps that they take. Isn't this wonderful? This is so great to watch. That's funny. The other one is not displaying at all. It's just walking past now. So I wonder if perhaps this display was a bit too intimidating for him. to be over. So perhaps this male has won. He has intimidated the other one enough. And there they go. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how we would know for sure. Um, but look at that. Now it seems like it's over. And they're walking again. The interesting thing is both these males have moved away from the females in the opposite direction. The females moved directly behind them through the thicket onto the other side, through the drainage line. So don't know, don't really know how, who won this one. Just having a look. Yeah, that's interesting, very interesting behavior. Isn't that amazing how they walk and use those legs and dip their head. Just trying to have a look. Yeah, still, that one's now displaying, that's the one that wasn't. Let's see, they definitely seem like they are challenging each other. Oh, you'll see the other one in the background now. It should come into frame shortly, there it is. Look at that, that one's raised its head. <laughs> that is a fascinating behavior. Very interesting, and I think what's triggered this is purely the, because those females have been around um, because often you do get these bachelor herds with these inyala, the males hanging around together and they tolerate one another but I think as soon as you throw females in the mix then, uh, then they, um, they try and challenge one another and see who is more dominant obviously but that was great that's a good start You know, they're just moving off into the thicket now. Looks like they've stopped. I'm so glad you got to see that. It was wonderful. It sounds like we've got the squeaky brakes this morning again. Oh dear. 
Anyway, let us head over to Brent, get an update from him, see where he is and any luck with the female leopard. Well, we're just coming around the edge of quarantine on the western edge, right next to this little ravine here. And if Karula was going to grab an impala, it was going to be in this area and she's going to drag it back there. We saw a female impala by herself who is still lactating. Whether it's one of the, the two babies that Karula's already eaten or if it's a third, difficult to say. So in a little while, uh, the uh, in Commander Bond will be stretching his legs so we'll probably just ask them to go have a quick look through that bottom corner there see if maybe there's not another kill there uh, unless we get lucky with a drag mark or tracks I think there's a strong possibility that they are still in this area and they've got another baby impala now as I said in baby impala season sometimes it makes it quite hard to find the leopards um, because they normally don't put them up on the tree before they finish eating them and also when they drag it it's often so light that you don't see the drag marks going across the road. So a baby impala is even lighter than a stenbok or a grey diker. So sometimes you've just got to go on a, a gut feel. Oh, they flew away, don't worry, Brian. There's some parrots, but they've gone. Um, a gut feel. Uh, oh, a gut feel and a bit of thinking like a leopard, a bit of intuition like like Brian and I did yesterday, we're pretty sure that even if Karula wasn't in this in this block, the cubs were, so she's going to be returning. And that's why we worked very slowly. We just meandered through here and we were lucky enough to find all three in one walk. Now, Hasana wasn't too far from where Karula and Shungile were. It was probably about six, 700 meters. So there's a very good chance that uh, they would have met up again. Now, it could also be that Hasana was just being Hasana. We've seen him do it before where he wanders far from where mom, his mom and sister are, chasing things, being an independent naughty little boy. Yeah, so we're going to keep on this loop and if we get no tracks, then we'll go have a quick look up towards the, the gate and the boundary for the Inkahumas and um, I don't know what the time is but uh, when, when James is out, if if he gets out before we get back, we'll send him on a walk down there and hopefully he'll be able to find them on foot. Uh, if we get back before James is out, I might take a quick stroll. But it's nice to send bushwalk into an area where you think they're, they're, they're leopards because when we walk from the vehicle, track from the vehicle, obviously we can't be gone for too long. Where there's bushwalk, can like really slowly work an area nicely and see if there's any sign of those animals there. Morning Jason. Uh, Jason would like to know on which property do we see the Anderson male leopard. Uh, we only, only have seen him on Arethusa, Jason, so that's where we see Mr. Anderson. And then again, normally only on the, on the western side of Arethusa. And so from oh, around the Murrakean, maybe a little bit east of the Murrakean River, and then he, he, most of his territory extends towards the Manuleti River, and then follows the Manuleti River all the way down to the Sand River. Oh, dearie, dearie me. Queen Karulski. Why weren't you just sitting atop a termite mound waiting for us? That's definitely not Karula style. But the nice thing about the cubs is sometimes they do get playful and you suddenly spot a tail hanging from a tree. Well, I'm not sure what this weather is going to do. I don't think it's going to rain. What do you think? Nah. I think it's too high. And I think... Oh, I don't know if the sun's going to break it up. I think over the course of the day, uh, the sun might break it up. And so I don't think we're going to get too much participate. Oh, <laughs> precipitation, not participation. Precipitation out of these clouds. 
You're more than welcome to participate in the safari by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or uh, the email address questions at wildearth.tv. Okay, so without having to go walk around in the bush for too long, I'm going to go see if we can find any sign of the lions. Hopefully they've decided to rejoin us after their little visit to Sibambili. Morning, Abby in Ohio. Now, Abby is wondering, do I think because the lions are more mobile, it might mean the hyenas make their way back to utilize the den sites on Juma? <whistles> Abby, I don't know, to be honest, and it's difficult to predict. I mean, the lions have been mobile for a couple of days now. We, st I still, you don't hear hyenas like you used to around here. I mean, they're not even raiding camp at the moment. We haven't lost a dustbin in, in about a week and a half. So there's no, no outward signs, signs that they are back uh, on, on Juma, apart from the tracks. And obviously the hyenas wonder 20 miles in a night. So that's nothing really to go by. And they wonder all over the place. Uh, I hope so, Abby. That's uh, probably the best answer I can give. Uh, and I have gone past and checked those den sites a couple of times. Was that a lilac-breasted roller? It, was it a snort? Wind's not in our favor. Blowing the sound, if it was a, an alarm call away from us. Now, when you're driving, often the lilac-breasted roller's nasal squawk can sound like an impala alarm call, but the fact that we didn't hear any more means it probably was a lilac-breasted roller somewhere there, but as I said, the wind is going away from us, so any sound, just catching the edge of it as it's carried away. Again, for those of you who watched the Juma dam cam, there was much thunder, lightning, and threats of a, a raging torrent and downpour. But alas, I think we had about nine spots. <laughs> Seems like our drivers started off somewhat like Byron's of yesterday, uh, with not much to be seen. But don't worry, the killer bees are on the case. We don't give up that easily. Dai says, please find roaring lions. We miss them on the camera. Uh, I will do my utmost, Dai, and uh, hopefully we will find the Ngormas. Uh, it looks like the Birminghams have uh, gone towards the east. Uh, so the last time I saw them, they were heading towards the Kruger boundary with uh, Buffalo's Hook. Uh, maybe going to visit the Torchwood Pride, see how their eastern front is holding. Seems like they've got tired of waiting for Amber Eyes to come into Estrus and they've either heard threat from the East in terms of new males or maybe picked the whiff of a female who might be a little bit more forthcoming on the air and they've marched off to the East.
and of course I did forget a named road and thanks to all of those who remind me Aubrey's Road hey, you deserve your own road after 27 years Cindy, good morning, good morrow, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, Cindy would like to know if animals, do animals ever get struck by lightning? Because there was an incredible amount of lightning last night. Yes, they do. And uh, believe it or not, I've actually seen one get struck by lightning in Zambia. Uh, generally not in areas like this, uh, but on big open grasslands and plains, it, it is possible and uh, in the Busanga Plains in the northern Kafui of Zambia we were watching a lone buffalo bull munching away when he was untimely cooked alive by a lightning bolt. We went back to camp after that, we decided that enough chances, although in, in a car normally you're quite safe from lightning with your rubber tires however we generally make a dash home for lightning because we've got a large aerial sticking out of our back uh, as well as how many Brian? One, two, three, four, five. Five deep cell batteries and uh, it's all great if your in tires insulated but uh, we don't want to have a battery go kaboom We're definitely far more allergic to lightning than rain. Okay, so I was hoping we might find some signs of the Ingomas in this area. That's why we're going so slowly this morning, we're not rushing anywhere. Uh, one of the best little bits of advice I ever, I ever got was from my art teacher. And uh, a very, very interesting man, had an amazing life and he was a, a great fly fisherman. So we got on like a house on fire. And uh, I tend to get quite excited and move around at great speed when the time calls for it. But, uh, when I was drawing and painting, uh, what he said to me is he wrote down, he just in, and he had the most amazing handwriting, and he wrote down on this little white card, Festa Lenta, apparently Latin for rush slowly. Uh, whenever I start getting ahead of myself, I try to remember Mr. Penny, and uh, Festa Lenta, rush slowly. While we continue to rush slowly through the African bush trying to find what secrets there are to uncover, Byron has made it all the way down to the deep east and is on the plains of the cheetah. Now we're on cheetah plains and I've just found this beautiful Warburg's eagle. sitting right at the top of the tree. There was a lilac breasted roller that was mobbing it earlier. And um, it's just perched up at the top there, scanning the landscape. I wonder what we're gonna find on Cheetah Plains today. Hoping, I'm hoping we have some luck. Lovely to see the Warburg's eagle perched up on top of the tree like that.
just having a look around here for any tracks or signs of animals that might Nothing yet, hang on. There's a water buck through there. A few water buck off to the right, there we go. No, oh, it sounds like that lilac breasted roller is back mobbing. Oh, then it just disappeared, disappeared, but it was shouting at that Warburg's eagle. I think that's what it was shouting at. No oh dear. Looks like those water buck have moved off. Um, now these rollers, it's incredible to see how they mob birds of prey, even though there's, they won't be a direct threat to them, but they would still, they, sorry, I'm just listening to updates on the radio while I'm here too. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so those um, lilac breasted rollers will mob birds of prey like a Warburg's eagle, even though there's no direct threat to them, purely because it is a bird of prey. They try and mob them and chase them away. We see it a lot with the Gymno Gene too, or the African Harrier Hawk, that gets chased by starlings and rollers and all sorts of birds and drongos. But the reason for that is it is a direct threat. That bird raids nests, looks for chicks or eggs, and feeds on them. So that bird is a direct threat to them and they try and mob it and chase it away. This eagle is not a direct threat to that roller, however the rollers, they, they, they're quite territorial and they don't like birds of prey around and they'll come and mob them and try and chase them away. It's very interesting to see. Oh, there's a water buck back there again, another one, just off to the right. Female water buck. That's nice. There's often water back in this area. Um, I th there is a little water hole not too far from here, from here, and I, I often see water back around here. This little section of cheetah plains. And I've got a beautiful little stowaway this morning. Have a look at this moth. Looks like the wind last night damaged it a little bit. Um, but beautiful, beautiful moth though. Look at those antenna and how hairy and furry this moth is. Um, but I wonder, because it was so windy last night, we had that, I mean, we had that storm building up, building up. We got a few drops of rain, nothing serious. It it disappeared quite quickly, almost as quickly as it arrived. But it was wonderful to have the lightning and hear the thunder around us. And um, a bit of rain and then it stopped, which was a bit unfortunate. I really thought we were going to get more rain. Um, but alas, it was not to be. I wonder if this little guy is okay up here. Let's see if I can just actually put it down because I think the wind might blow it away. There we go. Come sit on the seat next to me. There we go. That's much better. It's probably warmer down there for it too. <laughs> All right, I'm going to head towards the clearings on Cheetah Plains. While I do that, let's head back to Brent's and get an update. Welcome back. We're now on the, our western edge. The Nkumas were not far from here last night. And when you get these long roads like this, I always just like to pick up the binos, have a little squiz, and I can see a road. There we go. Now. Seems like they had a few more drops. We had nine drops at camp up, up here in the western corner. I think they had 14 drops of rain. 
temperature is dropping a little bit so I wonder if there isn't a, a bigger cloud bank coming in so our weather almost always comes from the sort of southeast and it is looking a little bit darker oh let me stop for you there you can see there's a there's a darker lower bank coming in even you see below the darker bank <laughs> there it is you can see the edge of it so even these cool overcast days they, they help uh, in terms of breaking the drought because what little surface water is here it, it doesn't evaporate at the same rate and uh, of course it also gives quite a few of the plants some respite because they do lose the grass in particular and, and some of the trees will lose a lot of their moisture to these sort of 99 degree days okay come on in Kahumas this is where you were sleeping yesterday now all you need to do is a hop a skip and a jump back to Juma they didn't hop on skip jump there now all this low cloud reminds me of a, a bit of an African folklore. Now it's a, it's an interesting one because it's not uh, from the local tribes. It's one of the, the first settlers folklores. And I'm sure some of you out there have been to Cape Town. Brian, have you been to Cape Town? I was born in Cape Town. He was born in Cape Town. So there we go, Brian, Brian's a Cape Townian. Brian, you don't speak like a Cape Townian. You don't go, oh my God, like there's a like mountain. It like gives peace. Yes, Cape Townians are, are, are basically their own little country out of our, uh, from the rest of us South Africans. We do love them, but they are a bit strange. Um, how many, Cape, who have we got from Cape Town in camp? He's Pretoria though, originally. Jandre thinks he's Cape Townian. Um, well, yes, but he's from Joburg, but he's embraced the Cape Townian way. Um, I'm just trying to think. Anyway, let's get back to a far more interesting story than how strange Cape Townians are. Uh, uh, Final Control says none of us are Cape Townian, we're all hard workers. Yes, Cape Townians also like to book off at about 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Uh, okay, no, let's get back. So there was a, a guy by the name, a Dutch, one of the Dutch settlers, his name was Van Hunks. And there's now a, a burger joint that's very good, named after him in Cape Town. And so Van Hunks was quite a poor guy, he used to do odd jobs around the Cape Colony. And uh, then he just disappeared. And he returned many, many years later with lots and lots of cashish money and horses and fancy hats because they were big into the fancy feathered hats in those days and you know the puffy sleeves and so he came back with uh, a lot of wealth that he, he did not have and obviously all the rumors spread through the, the bustling metropolis of Cape Town which probably had some population of about 400 and 500 settlers at that time but he moved into a, a little a little house he built himself a nice little house uh, quite high up on the slopes um, it was called, oh, I can't remember the name, the original name of that mountain, but we all know it now as a, is it Lion's Head. So he had a, a, a lovely little home there and looking, uh, looking over both Table Bay and towards Camps Bay, Bantry Bay, a very beautiful, beautiful place. And his favorite thing to do was to smoke tobacco. And there's a large flat rock on on Table Bay, I mean on, on Lion's Head Mountain, where he used to like to sit and, and smoke his pipe. He had one of those long clay pipes and uh, he used to smoke the strongest of strong tobacco. And one day Van Hunks was sitting on his flat rock, puffing away, and a stranger arrived in very fancy garb. And Van Hunks wasn't quite, he wasn't a very social man. Uh, a stranger arrived 
with his own long clay pipe and his own big bag of tobacco. And he had very fancy shiny clothes and a pointy, pointy fancy hat with lots of feathers. And he also had a, a Van Dyke's beard. It was very sort of sharply trimmed pointy beards with a pointy moustache. And he sat down and he tried to engage in conversation with Van Hanks. And Van Hanks sort of and answered him in monosyllables, not so interested in chatting. Now, Van Hanks used to send his staff off to go do the shopping and that, and he used to avoid the the harbour. So that's where the, everyone thought maybe he became a pirate. And that's how he gained all this wealth that he didn't have when he left. And there was all sorts of rumours that he might have murdered his crew, took their share of the loot and as well and all that. So he was sitting on the rock. And the other, the other gentleman who had now joined him also started puffing on his pipe. And eventually, after a long time, he managed to stimulate some conversation out of Van Hunks. And Van Hunks, being a cagey individual, never really gave on where, what, where he gained his wealth, what he did. He just sort of carried on answering in very short sentences. And then the stranger said, I am the greatest smoker in the Cape Colony. And Van Hunks chuckled and he said, No, my dear good sir, I am the greatest smoker. No one smokes more tobacco than me and no one enjoys it more than me. So the stranger says, Van Hunks, a wager, sir. And uh, I, will, I will bet you I can smoke more tobacco and enjoy it more than you, uh, Van Hunks laughed and said oh, oh and, and the wager and I'll wager it for your soul Van Hanks laughed quack, 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 quack. I lost my soul many years ago why not let's just smoke for the pure enjoyment of smoking and they started smoking and they smoked one day went by and the smoke from their rock was blown by the southeaster and the big wind that comes off the Atlantic Ocean in Cape Town and it went up onto Table Mountain and it slowly started forming a tablecloth. Three days, four days, eventually after five or six days the stranger collapsed, it was green in the face, his hat fell off. And Van Hugs said, I knew it! I knew you were the devil! His horns were showing. And the devil was very, very angry that he was outsmoked by Van Hunks. And their smoking had caused the table cloth to spread over Table Mountain. And uh, the devil, enough of this, said, that's it, Van Hunks, you're coming with me. But he said, but I won the smoking competition. And he says, I don't care. And rushed him off to hell and uh, now sort of the original Dutch folklore and Cape Malay folklore is that uh, whenever the southeaster blows and the, t and the, and the tablecloth comes onto Table Mountain, uh, Van Hanks has irritated the devil so that he takes him back to his favorite smoking rock and uh, the Van Hanks and the devil sit in, co in companionable silence going so there we go, a bit of a different South African folklore, uh, away from the more traditional ones. There are quite a few of those, of ghosts and all sorts, so here we go. I thought I'd mix it up a little bit. And that's also because we have not seen a track <laughs> or an Impala. <laughs> but hopefully there's something on Impala plans. Hi, Jason Curtis. I thought I was starting off with a Robin Hood story. I don't, there's not, I'm trying to think of any sort of Robin Hood-like folklores or stories from, from this part of Africa, and I can't think of any offhand. Hmm, maybe something to research.
Oh, and it seems like I can hear Aubrey. And uh, that means Bushwalk's about to be out, so I just want to get send them in the right direction to go look for where I think those leopards might be. And as you can see, Impala Plains is devoid of even bird life this morning. Aubrey, Aubrey. Morning orbs, I checked last position, uh, the Nyama is Palil, uh, but there was one female impala wandering around by herself calling uh, to the southwest of the, the, the bush bry site, so maybe they've caught another one down in the Shkova there. Okay, here we go. We've deployed our mobile unit, our mobile foot unit, which was of course Brian and I yesterday, and Aubrey. Oh, we haven't had a really, oh, we, I suppose we have had some quiet mornings recently, but I mean, I haven't had a morning this quiet in a long time. It's that in-between weather, it's not really good for birding, so the wind's a bit strong, not quite enough moisture in the air. Well, it seems like quiet is a, is the standard for t this morning's sunrise drive so far. So far, remember so far. So let's go see how quiet it is on cheat plants. Now, uh, I've just got to the plains on Cheetah Plains um, and I don't see too much at the moment. I'm scanning to see if there are cheetah around. So I'm using the binoculars and scanning very, very carefully. Nothing just yet. Uh, but what I do see, it is quite nice, let's have a look down here. Some wildebeest with little calves. Nice bit of water down here. It almost looks like this area got a lot more rain than we did last night. See little little mud pools and wallows, a little bit of mud here and there. Alright, there we go. And I just heard half the name, so I do apologize. It sounded like Brian from Missouri was asking, um, do we get flash floods? Uh, Angela from Missouri wanted to know, do we get flash floods in this area? And uh, if so, does it affect animals? So Angela, we don't necessarily get a lot of flash floods around here. We do, g I say that, but we have had in the past, um, after heavy rains, um, the, um, all these little drainage lines fill up and they flow into the rivers. And that uh, causes the, um, the water to rise quickly. But the animals all know the instinct, instinct kicks in and then they're able to get to safety. They just go to higher ground, that's all. Um, you might get one or two animals affected, but very, very little. And we had some serious, serious floods in 2010. Um, it was very bad, this whole area of Kruger. There was a, a cyclone over Mozambique and it affected this area very, very badly. And we had devastating floods. A lot of areas were um, were very badly um, affected, and uh, but uh, but the, it 
And the animals seem to be fine. Have a look at those beautiful little wildebeest calves now. Lovely to see them. Really nice and peaceful out on these plains. It's still very, very overcast and cloudy, but fortunately. We've got the, the wildebeest around here. I'm still just scanning around, having a look to see if there's anything else walking about that we might find very interesting. I, want, I mean, I haven't seen predators in this area for quite some time. And I mean, we do know we get these those cheetah that pass through occasionally. But that doesn't doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. Nice and open here though. So it's actually a lovely area just to scan and have a look around. Uh, Joyce, you'd like to know where all the ostriches disappeared to. So I think they probably just flew into Kruger. <laughs> um, Joyce, they, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't seen ostriches here before. Um, I think they, they were around just before I kind of helped her and started helping out here. But um, but there are ostriches in this area and, and they do come through occasionally. I think what happens is depending on the, and probably the weather and the vegetation, the, the rain that we've had and the change in vegetation has a lot to do with it. They probably had to move into areas where there's more food for them. So um, that could be anywhere really. No sign of predators at the moment, no sign of this cheetah. But you never know, they could appear at any point, any stage. Okay, I can hear some of those European bee eaters flying above us again. Can't see them, but I can just hear them there. Three, three, three. Through, through. Sounds sound, sound something like that. Very strange. Beautiful call though. And you can just hear them flying really, really high, and especially when the weather's like this. And I, I said it yesterday, we, we heard them and we saw a few flying about. I said they usually do call and fly really high if the weather is bad and if there's a potential chance of rain. Now I wonder if they're not doing it again because they think it's going to rain. It's amazing, you can hear them, but you can't see them at all. And it's very, very cloudy this morning, so there could be a chance of rain. It would be nice, it's a, such a nice, cool morning. Ah, now, Brent and I are not the only ones out this morning. Um, apparently, Van Hunk himself is joining us, and he's doing the bushwalk this morning. Let's go and meet him. Good morning everybody, it's lovely to be with you here on this, well, I suppose slightly blustery and crisp morning on foot from the wilds of the Greater Kruger National Park. Jean-André is on camera, hello Jean-André. It's very nice to be back with Jean-André on foot. Of course, this is my first experience with him for some time on account of his disease, which is now finished, is it? Yes. Good, it's finished everybody. Now, over here we have some impala. 
They have obviously run away. That's because of Byron, who was talking nonsense about me. And so the Impala have run away. And they were lots of them around here. We're on quarantine clearings. Our plan this morning is to head off towards that area there, uh, where there is a sort of braai site. That's a sort of barbecue site, if you like, where the guests in the lodge go and have their dinner sometimes. And that's because Brent Leo Smith is not cooking us anything, but he did think he heard some Impala alarm calling in that area. We know Karula's around here. We found one track already just down the way there. So maybe she's around here with the youngsters. And I think for the next little while, she's going to spend time here. Because of these clearings are the only clearings in the area that afford the animals this kind of a view, I think she's going to spend time here because of the little impala. There are always going to be little impala somewhere around here. And I think uh, many of them are going to fall prey to the delightful Queen of Juma. Now, the other thing to say to you, of course, is that we are as live as Byron and Brent. And that means you must talk to us, please. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And while we are going to hopefully spot Karula, we're also going to be looking for the smaller things that we can find out here. And hopefully we'll find some little gems of the summer. Uh, we're on account of the fact that it's a bit cloudy. Uh, there's not a great deal. I don't think that there's going to happen in the way of insect activity. But we might find the odd spider, perhaps a scorpion or so. Let's go and find out, Chandre. Stop dilly dallying, man. Let's get on with things. Now, one of the things that I wanted to tell you about, or what, what that I've been observing over the last little while, last season during the drought, I made a huge, a long comment about the fact that I thought there was going to be a little bit of bush encroachment, because I gave the long and involved explanation of how it is that a seedling like this has a long taproot system, whereas a grass like this over here obviously doesn't. It's got a very um, sort of shallow-rooted, adventitious root system. And that means when there's rain, the grass is uh, sort of at a competitive advantage. It's got that shallow root system, so it grows up much more quickly because the water is in the surface. And when there is not a lot of rain, the taproot system of a tree like this, so root that goes deep down is a much more effective strategy. So in, in a drought year, like we've just had, the trees tend to take hold in the absence of competition from the grasses. I hope that makes sense. Now, we've had good rain this year. Not amazing, but not bad. Pretty much normal. And last year, we th we noticed if, if Jandre, sorry, I'm going to ask you to come around this way, Jandre. If we look at all of these seedlings here, they were not here at the beginning of 2015. And they've all kind of grown up now, I think on the back end of that drought. Now, the thing with bush encroachment is once it begins, it's very difficult to reverse. And so this is the process of the beginnings of bush encroachment here. Uh, the bush is taking over the grass and it's gonna be interesting to see if the grass manages to compete in amongst these trees. I mean, this clearing has been artificially cleared many times and I suspect that is probably going to have to happen again. And again, if we look over here, you can see that the trees are taking over and this will very shortly be a fairly large thicket just around where my stick is pointing there. So that's the case of the ecology of quarantine clearings. On we go. Ah, Brent apparently has an update for you. Let's head straight across to him and I'll keep you posted on any leopard tracks that we find. So we've extended our search outside. The Nkumas are definitely, from the area we checked, have not crossed back into Juma. So um, I think I will go down towards Cheetah Cut Line. What do you think, Brian? Yeah. Take a slow bumble that way. Now, one of the reasons I want to go towards Cheetah Cut Line is that it's the area that's had probably the most rain on Juma. So maybe we'll find a flower or two we haven't seen. And I just haven't been there for a while. So I know I have full faith in James and Aubrey that if Karula and the Cubs are in that area around quarantine, that's the best chance we have at finding them. So I think we will spread our wings and move further to the east of Juma. Unless, of course, we find tracks, or even better, we find a cat. There was one Birmingham apparently last night in Buffalsuk, so who knows, maybe he's meandered to the south.
I say it's that funny weather. It's not quite good weather for birding. It's not good weather for mammals. Well, unless you've got cats, but you've got to find them first. Could be on the move. Could be stepping out in front of us at any second. Now? No, not the second. So Brian and I were discussing. We're going to make a play at our record, which is 38 bird species in one sunrise safari. Not today. We've decided we're going to have to choose the right weather before we make a play at it. And we think we got 38 species without the cuckoos and the redback shrikes and the, and the other migrants that are here now. So we're thinking we might hit that miracle 50 if we choose our morning correctly. And um, Ooh. And you like it, visual from Chilicatlan? Copy, thanks, Andrew. I'm on Twin Dams. I'll make my way towards that area. I wonder what it is, wonder what it is. Excitement to see. We can go from just ambling along and you know, when you know, you know. It's going to happen on Cheetah Cut Line. That's where we're going. We're just going to go there a little faster now. Still making sure we don't miss Karula's tracks, don't worry. We like to keep things in suspense. to a race towards Cheetah Cut Line. And while we do that, uh, I wonder what's happening in the Far East. And of course, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Cheetah Plains. I wonder what Brent is, or what they've found on Cheetah Cut Line that Brent is racing to. That's exciting. Um, we have not found anything. Um, <laughs> scanning these areas, having a look around. Now, there were side striped jackal around this area last time I was here. Wondering if they're about this morning, that would be great. Now, what have they done here? This is new. Looks like they've built a dam. Oh, they have indeed. And it's not quite full at the moment. <laughs> There's actually no water yet. They're expecting heavy rains, I believe. I think if it fills up, this will be a beautiful dam. This is new. trying to remember where this road goes. This is all very different now. Oh, there we go. Look at the bee eaters, bee eaters. Sorry, but it's just... There they go. Just off to the left of that tree. Those are all the European bee eaters. Wow, look how many there are. That's fantastic. And you might be able to hear them. I'm gonna keep quiet for a second. Do you 
hear that? Beautiful sound, lots of them. That's a nice flock of European bee eaters. And I do, I do think the weather has got something to do with it. That's why they are flying and calling constantly like that. But that was nice, nice to see the European bee eaters. Uh, yeah, let me try to show you a close up of them. They are very, very colorful, beautiful birds. Quickly find it. Now that's the colour in the um, or the picture that the books would have. A beautiful picture over there, and then I'll show you a photo of one. A beautiful colour. Look at that. Really, really beautiful birds, and amazing how they migrate all the way down to to southern africa in the in the in our summer they come back for the for the summer and they go up to north africa and europe hence european bee eater i think to to spain i think they're around spain the southern parts of spain so all over Well, Soraya, you want to know, is there one location that's considered to be the birding capital of the world? Yeah, I, I've never heard of anything like that. I, I don't think so. I mean, every area is different. There are birds all over. Um, you know, South America has got amazing birds. Madagascar's got wonderful birds. Parts of Africa, the, the various parts of Africa all have different bird species all over. So I, d I don't think there's a particular capital. No, I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to think where else. It's got amazing birding. Um, yeah, you, know, you know, I think every area is different. Every area is beautiful, and especially out in these in the in the bush felt. Well, these areas that we are in, there's wonderful bird life. Really is wonderful, wonderful bird life. Botswana has a lovely abundance of birds because they get a lot of these birds that we're seeing here. But also because there's so much water around, you do tend to see a lot more water birds, which are very interesting and different. Jackal, there we go, well spotted. Viam, there's a side striped jackal straight ahead of us. Don't run, don't run. There we go, yes. Just as I was speaking about them, saying we do see them, or last time I was here, I saw them. That's a beautiful side striped jackal. The other jackal species we get in the area is the black-backed jackal, but we don't see them that, that often. Uh, well, not, not in this area, but uh, in the rest, um, the, well, the rest of Kruger and that, they are more uh, dominant than the, um, than the side-striped. You do see more black-backed. Just trying to see if there is another one around here, perhaps. There, there we go, there's the other one. It's coming, it looks like that is possibly the female. They are usually in pairs. And occasionally you might get family groups together, male, female and youngsters. Lovely. Unfortunately, these, um, these books don't give too much um, information on uh, 
on mating and that of the of the side striped jackal but as far as i know they do stay in pairs and and they do have litters between four and six pups usually that they'll look after and and then they um, i've seen it a few times male and female always together and then they'll have these little pups around um in a den site have a look there's a bird being mobbed by a roller let's see what that is oh the glare at the moment is a bit you know what that is? That looks like a yellow-billed kite. That's exactly what that is. Beautiful yellow-billed kite. Wow. Look at that tail. Typical kite tail. So things are happening for us, slowly but surely. Thank goodness. goes. Oh, they do scavenge quite a bit too, the yellow-billed kites. They will also um, try and look for their own food. Um, might potentially hunt. They, they feed on little termites in there too and other insects. Oh, Dina, you say when we see jackal they're often yawning. I, I didn't notice that now. Maybe I missed it. Um, I, you know what happens is I think um, I think with us driving past, um, we may have disturbed them. They may have been lying down resting. These side striped jackal are generally generally nocturnal, so I think they were possibly resting in the clearings around here. And maybe with the vehicle coming, they are very shy and they tend to move away quite quickly. Yeah, they are. They're still just off to the left. Let's see if they yawn again. So what I think has possibly happened is with us driving past and disturbing them and then waking up um, and moving, just like we see with the big cats, these animals, when they start yawning, it's, it's a sign of waking up and they're getting oxygen into their body. So I don't think it's a specific thing for jackal or anything. I think it's purely we must have disturbed them. They got up and they moved around. Devon, uh, you asked if the jackal varieties can interbreed. So, one thing in nature is that you you actually don't get interbreeding between different species. Um, it's interesting, but it's it's nature's way. And um, I mean, you do hear of stories of different animals um, being created by by. Areas that possibly put a, um, uh, the only example I can think of now is a lion and a tiger in the same area and then they try and get them to mate um, and they form this liger, I think. But, um, but that's not natural. That would never happen in nature. And with these jackal, no, they would not mate with black black jackal. Oh, there we go. There's a yawn. So I, th I don't think it's nervous behavior at all that. I think that is purely waking up, getting active, and um, and possibly looking for some food. They are beautiful, aren't they? This is a really, really nice surprise. Uh, marking its territory. Just as a canine would, and we know the jackal are part of the canine family. <clears throat> Look at those beautiful bushy tails. I do like jackal, I really do. Susan, all the way from Florida, you asked, are these tails on these um, on these jackal on the side striped a little bit more bushy than the than the black backed? I think they are, Susan, and, I'll, and I think they're a little bit a little bit longer, but they both both have bushy tails. Um, let me try to find a picture of the black backed and side striped quickly. Here we go. 
so just a quick look but um, both have bushy tails and you can see that but the side stripe tail does seem to be a little bit longer um, a little bit longer and also the side stripe jackal is um, is said to be a little bit larger than the black backed slightly larger um, by a few centimeters and one or two kilograms not by much but they do look quite different um, there we go I can hear a squirrel alarm calling and I think it might be at the jackal and I'm moving through there I can just see them they're just moving off through the thicket and I think that squirrel is alarm calling at the jackal Now, Casey, you wanted to know what the jackal's diet consists of. Now, the jackal is mainly a scavenger. However, the side-striped jackal are slightly different. And I'll tell you why. The side-striped jackal, can you believe it, do feed on a lot of fruit. Um, they, so they are omnivores. They um, <clears throat> sometimes birds, reptiles, insects, they do scavenge on carrion at times. But even fruit, these little um, side striped jackal have been known to eat fruit. Whereas the black backed jackal is a little bit different and is mainly a strict carnivore. And it will, it will feed on, uh, um, on, on carrion and they scavenge a lot. But they do also hunt for themselves if they have to. I've seen black backed jackal hunting springbuck which is another antelope that we get in Africa. We don't have them in this area though, but it's uh, just a little bit smaller than an impala, and they do hunt for themselves. If they're in big groups, they will be able to hunt. But, um, but yeah, the black backed jackal, also rodents and, um, and, and various other small creatures, but generally scavenge, whereas these little side stripe jackal will feed on just about everything. All right, now Brent, I think, has arrived at a surprise that he was racing to. Let's go and have a look what it is. Well, there we go. It is not the best view of a leopard we've ever had, and she is very far away, but fortunately for us, she's up in a tree, so we can just see her from our eastern boundary, and uh, it is a leopard we don't see as often as we would like to. It is a Tundi, and she's having a snooze in a fallen marula tree at the moment. Uh, how far would you say that it is from us, Brian? 900 meters? Three hundred. Yeah. There we go. She's oh, she's looking at us. Yay! Hello, Madam Tundi. It's Jamie's favourite. Looks like she's got quite a fat belly. Now, no sign of the cub so far. Could be around, but as I said, we're we're quite far away from it. Now, the direction she's looking, there is a herd of impala closer to us. So you never know what's going to happen. She might come visit our, nor our eastern boundary. Prim, just keep coming down Cheetah Catlan until you get my visual. Oh, tired kitty. Now, nice, cool, windy morning like this. It's good for hunting. I said it looks like she's quite well fed, but if an unsuspecting impala was to meander towards her, she would definitely attempt. Now, for those of you who might have joined us recently, and we've been seeing quite a lot of Queen Karula, who is the dominant female on Juma. Now, this is Tandi, who's part of her first litter. So this is the first cub that Karula ever raised to adulthood, her and her sister Shadow. Now, Karula is flanked 
on both sides by her daughters. Uh, to the east is Tandy and to the west is Shadow. Now that is quite normal for, for leopards. So as a female cub reaches maturity, if there is space, their mother will give them a part of their territory to start off their life in, and uh, she will try move or fight for new territory and to give the, the female cubs a good start in life. But we're going to sit here, hopefully she comes down quickly, quickly to James. Sorry to drag you away, everybody, from that beautiful leopard, but I don't think she's going anywhere. I think this chap probably will eventually. This is a great spotted cuckoo, and they're not common. I mean, look, we see them every year, but they're not common, and I just think that they're quite spectacular-looking birds, amazingly coloured. Oh, that's just wonderful. To have a sighting this length with one of these birds is very special indeed. I'm just going to try and quickly figure out which bird it is that they parasitize. I'll sort that out now quickly. And of course, as we know, the cuckoo's nasty parasites, very nasty to all other birds. They parasitize commonly the pied starling, which we don't get here at all. And crows, we also don't get crows here really, that's interesting. I wonder what else they parasitize. Pied crow, cape crow, pied starling, red wing starling, pale wing starling. I suspect it's probably birchal starling in this area that they're parasitizing. So a whole nesting bird, a birchal starling, and they'll find the nest of the birchal starling probably in one of these silver cluster leaves around here, like the one that he's looking in there, of course. Now that wasn't a silver cluster leaf, but they, the Cambritums do produce nesting holes, and I think that's probably what he's looking for, that of the birchal starling. Isn't that very special? I think that's marvellous. Now we've come along down through here, still looking for Karula. We saw some monkeys. They didn't look particularly panicked by life at all. And so we've carried on and we'll just sort of walk through this beautiful block here. It's one of my favourite areas to walk and see if we can't find the leopard. And also, just quickly while we're standing here, we'll see if we can't spot what the cuckoo, which nest it's trying to get. Or we can see it. Where's it? Oops on the ground. Oh yeah. You see it there, Jandri? Well spotted. Isn't this special? And they'll be insect eaters largely, so grubs and beetles and that sort of thing. I think this is very spectacular. You can probably just hear a little bit of the wind blowing. We had a very loud dawn chorus this morning and then it kind of dissipated quite quickly as the light came and the birds realized that it was going to be cloudy and so in slight objection, they headed off into the bushes. Or they just had to go to work today, jean it being a Monday morning and all that. Hmm? Yes. Gorgeous. Right, let's head straight back to Tundi. We'll sit a little bit of a while with this great spotted cuckoo and see if we can't find Tundi's mum shortly thereafter. Isn't that incredible? Uh, I hope that's amazing. We'll definitely have to keep a look out for that nest uh, to see if the cuckoos were successful in putting their offspring in it. Uh, we're still with Tandy and she's head is up, but she's not moving too much. She's snoozing quite comfortably up there. And I know it's not the best leopard sighting, but as a, a tracker of mine once said, even if you just see the tail, a leopard is a leopard. We'll give it a little bit longer and see if she clambers down from her perch.
So, Shamsung would like to know uh, which of the female leopards will give. Sh oh, sorry, I got <laughs> I got I got mixed up there. Shongile space. Um, or will she just take Shaluva's territory and uh, it or? Or do they know when, sorry, the game driver's being really loud. Um, so do the leopards know when uh, there's a free territory? Just give me one second. Um, I'll just set, brim. Just go straight, straight east from here, Info. Sorry about this, guys. I'll be back with you in a second. She's inside Torchwood, just from us. Between those two trees, just head straight east. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, everyone. We're back with you. But uh, so Shamsung's question was, which female leopard will make space for uh, the little Shongile, uh, and how do they know when there's a free territory, or will Shongile just take Shaluwa's territory? Karula will make space normally uh, for a female leopard, and so. In likelihood, Karula will give away normally some of the better parts of her territory to female offspring. Oh, she's up. Oh, and she's gone. You got it. Oh, apparently she's coming southwest. Okay, well, we're going to move a bit. She, apparently she's heading back southwest, which is down towards uh, the southern boundary. But we'll, we'll hang about here. Sorry, Shamsung, I'll get back to, to your question now while we're moving around. Uh, it, it's most likely Karula will give, give away a part of her territory. Uh, Shadow or Tandy will not in any way sequest any of their territory to their mother's daughter. So that, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, if anything, they would give a young, young Shongile a very hard time. So it's likely that maybe Karula will move a bit further to the north into Shaluva's territory and leave that core area of Juma maybe um, for her little offspring. But also, it also depends. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As everyone wants to talk to me today, is that, I'll be with you in a second. Oh, hey! Minjan! Sharp, sharp, and four. So, the guys have found some leopard there. The male one, but it's inside that vehicle. Inside Vortella, that, that way. That, that triple M section of uh, And there's, uh, um, what's her name? Tandy. Tandy, she's coming back apparently, yeah. yeah okay. She's coming back this way. Okay, I'll, I'll jump on the Eastern Channel, I'll go find out now. Okay. okay. Western Channel. Western Channel. Ah, my Western Channel doesn't work, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Okay, sorry about that. Yes, there's morning meetings everywhere here today. So let's just finish chatting about that, uh, those leopards quickly. So apparently there's a male leopard down there. So <laughs> decisions, female, male, male, female, male, because it's inside Juma. So I think we'll leave Tandy. We had a, a good view of her, even though it was from a distance. So let me just try to remember where we were. How do leopards know when there's a, a vacuum in the territory where there's a, a leopard moved? Well, uh, generally, there'll be a lack of vocalization, a lack of scent marks, but they'll have to be close to that boundary to, to realize that. Okay, let me go see if we can find out about the male leopard. I wonder who it could be. Pandemonium on the southern boundary today. Leopard here, leopard there. Right, so the male leopard sounds like it's inside Juma, so that's why we head back towards that one. I have no idea which leopard it is. Okay. Cheers, guys. Crossing back forwards. 
Okay, sorry, thumbs up to this guy on the left and people driving on the right, but let's go back to James on foot while I try to figure out what's going on. It is a busy morning, isn't it? That's wonderful, of course, out here. Leopard morning is what we want, really. Now, have a look over here in this drainage line. What we have is a gorgeous, gorgeous example of a false thorn tree, Albizia, I think that's probably Forbesii, which is the large fruited or large podded false thorn. It has no pods on it at the moment, of course, and that is because it's just not pod time, really, is it, Jandre? No, not at all. Now, if you listen very carefully, you might just be able to hear a robin. Now, that robin's going that's walking down here. We're in the area roundabout again where we thought maybe we'd find Karula, and we think that she might be down here. So Aubrey's just wandered down to have a look. So let's come over here and let's have a look and see. There's Aubrey and he's just very silently walking along the side of this drainage line. Now the reason we do that uh, is because she could easily be lying in the shade down here. There's lots of cover for her if she wants to hunt. Hosanna was around here as well. We saw him yesterday on foot. Well, I didn't, but um, Brent did apparently uh, saw, see him on foot as well. And so he could easily be around here. And so we're just gently walking along the banks of the drainage in order to look down into it. Now, what we don't want to do is give them a fright. And that's why things, we walk very slowly. It's highly unlikely that we'd spark some kind of a reaction that was in any way dangerous to us. But what we don't want them to feel is afraid. And especially the young male, because if you can get a young male leopard uh, habituated to you on foot for the period between, say, I don't know, about a year old and up to when they go independent, they become the most fantastic animals to view on foot. Once they go independent, they lose their kind of enjoyment and um, excitement at being around human beings on foot, and then, well, you know, they just kind of ignore us. But round about between this age and independence, they really are great fun. Uh, Aubrey has checked now the base of the drainage. He says there's nothing there. Let's have a look at the small flower while we are waiting to see what Aubrey comes up with. Chandri, I don't suggest you try and step in amongst this lot because I don't think you'll ever leave again. I shall point at it with my fingers and my stick. It's a beautiful morning glory and I don't know exactly which Ipomea species it is. They're called Ipomea, which I always think is quite a nice name. I don't know why really. And there it is, beautifully purple. And I suspect it's a different kind of species to the ones that we find normally on the sides of the roads. This one obviously likes to live in shade and likes to live in slightly less disturbed areas. They tend to grow on roadsides because they like disturbed areas. They're almost a sort of um, pioneer vegetation, if you like. And this one is growing underneath a very nastily thorned black monkey thorn. Acacia burkii. Now it's not alone here. John can you see my hand? I'm going to point at something else. Here is my hand. Follow it down. There is another flower about to come out. Can you see it, John No. No. Can you see my hand? Yeah. You're right. There's a purple flower about to come out. It looks like maybe one of the pea family. Mm, no, it's not. I don't know what that is, and I'm not going to pick it because it is going to still open up. And there are a whole lot of ants trying to feed off it. And so in, you know, I always kind of say this, but contained within this fallen acacia burkii or black monkey thorn, we have an entire ecosystem, at least two or three different species of flower. The grass here, is that wonderful grass called guinea grass. And it is the favored grass of things like buffalo. It loves to grow in shade. It loves to grow near um, acacias because acacias are legumes. They fix nitrogen in the soil. And so, mm, it's a good sweet grass. Delicious. It tastes like cut grass, basically, and the good stuff does taste like that. There's no bitterness attached to it at all. So that's why the animals love it. And this particular grass species has managed to find itself a very safe place to grow. And then, over here, we have 
a whole lot of lilies. And on these lilies, I'm not sure which lilies they are, but on the lilies there is a caterpillar. Jandri, I am going to retrieve this caterpillar for you and you are going to be sore pleased with me. Um, Soraya, while I do this, I'm just going to break this leaf off. I'll put him back here. You want to know what I think the birding capital of the world is? Well, Soraya, I would suggest quite strongly... Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I would suggest quite strongly, Soraya, while we look at this caterpillar of who's... And I don't know what it's going to look like as an adult that Costa Rica, somewhere like that, on the equator, would be the birding capital. The closer you get to the equator and the lower down you are, the greater the number of species tend to be, both in plants and animals. And of course, wherever you have a greater variety of plants, you'll have a greater variety of insects. And where you have a greater variety of insects, you're likely to have a greater variety of birds. So I would have said somewhere like Costa Rica, uh, along that band, coastal forest areas, I think you'd probably have the most number of bird species per se square mile or square kilometer. Now this thing has got a little bit of aposomatic coloration. In other words it's yellow and it's orange and it's black which normally means it's poisonous. Do you want to eat it Jean Ray? Jean Ray will eat just about anything. No, he's not really going to eat it, everyone. And I think it's colored like that because perhaps it's poisonous. And it's sitting on one of these lilies. And a lot of the lilies are toxic. They produce kind of toxic um, alkaloids and things that would make this caterpillar and then the adult poisonous. Anyway, I'm not sure which one it is. Let's put him back onto his lily plant. And I'm just going to see if there isn't something else in this fairly vast ecosystem that is the fallen acacia burkii tree here. So we've got the guinea grass, we've got the lilies, we've got the caterpillar and I'm sure there are a few other caterpillars. There are two or three different species of flower here. I'm going to walk around. There are plenty and plenty of ants walking up and down and up and down here. Mike, I don't know the answer to your question because I, um, I haven't really seen it. You say do ants, or not ants, do animals eat the morning glory flower? I think I've seen tortoises eating them, but I don't know, other than tortoises, I don't think I've seen a huge number eating them. The fact that they're on the ground indicates to me that they're probably not very tasty, because if you want to uh, be a successful plant out here, uh, you want to be kind of out of reach of animals, but they grow in open areas. And so I'm going to suggest that um, they're probably not very tasty, they're probably a bit toxic, and I think they're pollinated by ants because they're so close to the ground. They're not kind of open to the sky where a flying insect might come. They're open to ground-dwelling things, probably ants, I suspect. There's one other flower under here, and that's that one over there. Can you see that one there? Morning glory? You want to know about the morning glories that we have here, um, but I'm afraid I've missed your question, so I'm going to ask for it again from Rebecca. I'm just trying not to be attacked. Oh, this is interesting. This is the very, very first beginnings, I think. Can you see it here? Sorry. Can you see it there? I think this is the beginnings of Hibiscus cannabinus. If you look at the leaves, they look a little bit, uh, so I'm told, like the leaves of a cannabis plant. I'll pick one for you. Sorry, one sec, Jandri. And I think that's what that is. This is not, so this is not cannabis, this is not marijuana, but I think this is the beginnings of a hibiscus plant that has the name hibiscus cannabinus because the leaf looks like marijuana leaf, apparently. Uh, morning, Gloria, I'm going to ask you a question once more, and if we don't have any luck with it, then um, uh, we'll... Oh, hang on a second. Omkar, you're wondering about carnivorous plants in South Africa and whether we have any here. We have something called a carrion plant, but it isn't carnivorous. It, um, it's, <laughs> it smells like carrion. It's disgusting. But it, it's pollinated by flies, and that's why it smells like that. We don't, as far as I know, have any sort of Venus fly traps and all those, what are they called? Um, those, funnel, those funnel flowers that, uh, that kind of drown insects. We don't have any of those here, no. So I don't think there are any carnivorous plants in this area. Rebecca, do you hear me? Can we have Morning Glory's question once more, please?
There we go. Oh, Morning Glory, you want to know if the US, um, if these Morning Glories are like your Morning Glories in the US and only flower for one day. I knew that was going to happen. Negative Morning Glory, that is not the case. They do seem to, um, they do seem to flower for a little bit longer than just one day. Thank you, Jean-Dre. Are we okay now? Good, thank you so much. Vicious thorns. Right, come on then. Let's go and see if we can find a leopard. <laughs> Careful, Jandri. Right. Byron Sarao has returned from the deep east. Of course, he is normally from the deep south. He's back from the deep east. Let's go and find out what he's going to do now he's back in civilization. So we have returned, that is correct James, we're back on uh, uh, Vuyatela or Juma and no sign of anything just yet, so I know Brent had luck with the leopard and he's trying to get to another one. Um, he seems like he's on a mission this morning to find or to get to these leopards, which is great. So we're going to see what else we can find. Now I understand, and I don't know if I got the update correct, it sounded like they said they thought they had um, Tundi, but it was actually Karula. Oh, there's a lot of vultures over here. Let's have a look what's going on here. Wow, look at that. Plenty of vultures up in the tree on the right. Try and get a gap for us. Yeah, there's lots. Yeah, lots of vultures here. Have a look at this. I wonder why they are all here. We'll have to have a look around. Because there are vultures. And the other trees behind them. And those are most those are all white back vultures sitting over there. Let's uh, let's have a look in this area. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, that road goes quite close to the tree. I hope I don't chase off. Hang on. I just heard a Franklin alarm calling. Let's just have a quick look here. Uh, could have been nothing, but it just. Uh, Alright, um, I'm going to check this area with these vultures. Let's head over to Brent who's got another leopard to show you. Female. Look at this. We got told it was a male leopard, but I don't think this is. I... It looks like a... a female to me. Is that Shadow? The ears aren't tatty enough for Shadow. Oh, we're going to have to have a look. Yeah, she's moving half a stenbok. So we're called in for a male leopard. This is definitely a, definitely a female. Uh, Sean, if you cut, she is starting to move with the, the carcass deeper into where it's at. I don't know who that is. Well, looks a bit dark to be shadow for me. Ears just don't look tatty enough. Hmm, interesting. Let's try get a better look at her face. see where she moves that carcass to. She could be trying to take it up a tree. But that's definitely a female for me, it's not a male. I 
and that very big belly. This is what would generally be considered Shadow's territory. But I don't know, I just didn't think that, that leopard looked, her ears didn't look tatty enough for me, and she looked a little bit too dark. Maybe it's just because I haven't seen Shadow in so long, but oh, normally I'm pretty decent with those things. I wonder, who do you guys think it is uh, on the brief view we've had so far? Let me know, hashtag Safari Live, uh, questions at wildearth.tv. Which leopard do you think this is? I don't think it's Shadow. I, I, I am, could be wrong, of course, but I just the, the, she looks too dark and her ears don't look tattered enough for me to be Shadow. Now, Aaron is wondering, could it possibly be in Chila? In Chila means tail, that tail's way too short, um, for me at least. Uh, but just, just to let you guys know, sorry, I forgot earlier, that leopard we saw at the distance uh, that we got told was Tandy actually turned out to be Karula, uh, according to Ephraim when he arrived. So uh, it, it wasn't Tandy. Now, her coloration for me is almost Tandy, but this is far out of Tandy's range the only way she would normally be here is if she was looking for Tingana to mate and that would mean she's lost another cub but let's not jump to conclusions just yet let's wait till we get a, a much better view of her wonderful face Now, AC says does she look pregnant I think she just looks like she's got half a steenbok in her belly I'm quite, I'm fascinated to find out which leopard this is. Well, the one thing I'm 100% certain on is it's not a male leopard. Now she's heading down towards some thickets around a little dry riverbed. I'm just going to try to get up ahead of her. Watch out for you, Bob. So there's a nice open area coming up. I'm just going to try to get there so we can look back on her. It should take us 30 or so seconds. Okay, we might try to get a good spot shot of her face now. I don't know, does that look like Tundi to you, Brian? She's got that shadow Tundi body type, but it's a, too dark for, for, for shadow for me. And the ears just aren't bedraggled enough. A steenbok or baby impala, I've been so... I need to hide it in there. There she comes. Is that a baby impala? Yes, it's a baby impala, not a steenbok. You think Tandy? I'm also inclined to lean towards Tandy rather than Shadow, which means if she's this far out of territory, and she's possibly lost that last cub, and she's back in the estrus. But as I said, we're just guessing. That is not a fact. And, oh, many moons ago, someone lost a game drive blanket in this block. <laughs> there it is. It's been eaten by all the insects. I think I should have pictures of Tandy here. So once she stops, I will double check. 
And you guys remind me what Tandy spot pattern is, please? And uh, referring to the spot pattern. I can't remember it offhand, but if you, if you do know her spot pattern, let me know, please. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildlife.tv. Okay, well, we're going to try to get into a spot uh, where we can see her when she stops. While we do that, let's go see what Byron is up to. So I'm having a look around this area now with these vultures that uh, a few of them did take off. A lot of vultures around, but I can't, I can't see anything. I'm trying to see if I can smell anything, perhaps a carcass somewhere. I'm trying to look for tracks or I just don't know what it is, why they were all in this area. See the problem is they all, they, some of them have taken off and they're flying away now, but they're flying um, directly south. I see now that some of them are sitting here again, these vultures. Let's just have a look around here and let's see. Some are flying. Have a look just off to our right. You'll see them circling and flying about. Now, it does help if they do fly down, then we know more or less where a kill is or where the food is that they've been looking for. And... This is a good sign too because there's a juvenile batelier flying just above us. Sorry, if I'm all over the show at the moment with all these birds, but there's a juvenile batelier. Now, we do know that they scavenge and they are usually at carcasses quite quickly to try and, and, um, and feed on carrion before the vultures get in there. So it's circling above us. But we are close to our southern boundary, to the Gauri, Gauri access. So I wonder, um, let's just see, I'm just trying to have a look around, see where these birds go, or if they're just coming down to land in the trees. See, because not with vultures, you need to remember, it's not always that they land in the trees that are right next to a kill. They just look for the trees that are the largest trees that don't have don't have any vegetation in them that they're able to land in. It makes it easier to land in. So let's have a look. And I mean, there could be something in one of these blocks around us. It's th quite thick. You can't see anything. Doubt we'll even be able to drive through some of these areas. There's a lot of stumps and trees that have been pushed over and broken. Just have a look there. They seem to be going down. So it's interesting, it's um, interesting to see this behavior and I'm not sure what they've seen, if they've seen anything, and again there's not always a guarantee, but I just think with this amount of vulture activity that there must be something around, it could possibly be south of us, it could be in these blocks around here, but I don't see tracks, I haven't seen any tracks coming to the area. Maybe predators that have hunted anything. Maybe there was something that died of natural causes. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. 
You know what I might do quickly? Let me see if I can drive along this fire break. Let's have a look around here. <laughs> oh, it's tricky to look in these very thick areas unless you can get out and walk and really go tracking and, and searching and then more vultures off to our right here might hear a lilac breasted roller flying above us just calling it's difficult when you're driving and looking through these very thick areas you've got to look very carefully you've got to be patient and see maybe you get lucky and you find something For the moment, I don't see anything. I don't see any signs, any tracks. Also, what might help is if you switch off and you listen, maybe you hear something. If, for example, I'm not saying it is, but if maybe the lions have made a kill, if they're feeding, we know how aggressive lions can get around a kill. Now, we are searching. Brent is still trying to follow that leopard and see if he can get a view of it again. As soon as he does, we will head back to him, but he's moving through a very thick area at the moment. So he's stuck with me for now, but, uh, but let's just have a look and see if we can't find anything. But it doesn't look like it for the moment. Maybe the vultures were just resting in, that, in these trees around here. folks would like to know do we have any swallows in the area we do indeed we've got quite a few swallows that come through these areas um, and at the moment I've seen I've seen two or three species so we get the barn swallows which migrate from Europe back down here in the summer we have um, uh, red breasted swallows and we have lesser striped swallows there are some other ones that we get in this area and I'll show you some of them but uh, we do have quite a few species of swallows, of swallows that, uh, that do come through and we do see around. Let me show you quickly. Sometimes it's funny. That's why I always carry a book with me because occasionally these apps don't work properly. I don't know why. It can be irritating, but that's why it's important to have a book with you. I always, I always refer to the book generally, and it's just nice to having those calls available. But here are the swallows, some of the swallows. So red-breasted swallow, uh, this one over here. We get, we get greater striped and lesser striped swallow. Um, this one up at the top here, and this one here. Um, we get uh, the mosque swallow I have seen around this area, this little one, and then let me just have a look where the barn swallow is, here we go, 
Um, the white-throated swallow we get, um, the barn swallow, it used to be the European swallow and uh, we do see that quite often, that's one that is fairly common in this area. Rebecca, you'd like to know where do the birds get their names from? From, from their parents, Rebecca, they're the ones who name them. <laughs> Um, Rebecca, I don't know. I don't. Know. I don't know who names the birds. Um, it's just like animals. Uh, the obviously people who study the animals and the birds, um, and you get taxonomy, and that is basically how animals are named and how they are categorized into into certain species. So you have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and um, and. Every animal is put into classes and and basically worked down where you get the genus and the species, which are the last two names, the scientific names. So, for example, uh, the swallows, the barn swallow, Herundu uh, rustica, um, and that is the scientific name. So, you start getting into some very complicated stuff when you're looking at the scientific names, but that is the genus and the species. Then you've got, for example, all these other swallows are all in the Herundu genus, but the species will be different. So, wire-tailed wire -tailed swallow is Herundu smith smithii, Herundu uh, Dimidiata uh, is pearl-breasted swallow. Some of these scientific names are very difficult. It's all Latin, obviously. Um, but that's generally, I mean, the best way of explaining how animals and birds get their names. like if you think of lions and leopards exactly the same thing kingdom phylum class order family genus species and um, and then once you get down to the um, obviously the, uh, the the genus for lions and leopards and jaguars uh, which we obviously don't have in Africa but they all form Panthera, they were all under the Panthera genus. And then obviously the species is different. So lion, Panthera leo, and uh, leopards, uh, Panthera pardus. And that's obviously how they are linked. They, so they basically the same the whole way through up until that last little part of the, uh, of the species, which will be different. Now we are approaching twin dams, so let's just have a look if there's anything around here. Now you can tell there wasn't a lot of rain last night. These little water holes haven't filled up at all, these little mud wallows. There's still very little water around. We need some serious rains throughout the summer. Hopefully we'll get some more. Um, to fill up these dams. Oh, this is interesting. Some vultures down on the ground and possibly drinking. And that one over there and the other one just took off. It would be great to see if it does go and drink. That would be interesting. Now, what, um, vultures do need water. They do go down to drink occasionally. Well, all birds need water. Oh, and lilac breasted roller doing a bit of a display. Very, oh, it's just flown off. Um, could just hear it. There goes that vulture. I wonder if it's going to take off or if it's going to stick around. There it goes. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> almost didn't make the, the take off there, got a little close to the road. These birds, obviously, these big birds need, need a bit of a run up and quite a bit of lift to get off the ground. You can see that beautiful white patch on the white backed vulture. That is obviously why it gets its name, white backed vulture. You could see that clearly, that was very nice. Doesn't look like there's anything else around here. Oh, what little bird was that? Oh, so quick, it's so unfortunate. There's so many interesting little birds that we see, but you get a glimpse of them and then they, they fly past and they're just too quick for us to put on camera for you. That looked like that little long-billed crumbeck, but it was quick, I'm not sure um, if it definitely was. If you've got people on the vehicle, it's a bit easier to go to quickly say, oh, look there or look there, but it's obviously much harder with the camera. <laughs> oh dear, uh, Rebecca's just given me a question from Tracy, and Tracy, you would like to know what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Um, I don't know, I have no idea. So let me have a look quickly though and see if, uh, if this app perhaps has anything. Um, because the the information on the app is actually a little bit more so let's let's have a look at barn swallow um, okay uh, let's see if they've got anything regarding speed or velocity They're just going into the migrations and some migrating up to up to Russia. Um, can you believe it? Some of these barn swallows from here all the way to Russia, um, Italy, Middle East. They move throughout those areas. And uh, general habitats, foraging food, breeding conservation, malt. No, and measurements. No, unfortunately nothing on speed of this swallow. I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know who would study that and how accurate they would be. Um, I know they do studies on the um, on the fastest bird around, which I think is the, I think it's a peregrine falcon, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, f uh, fastest, one of the, f one of the fastest flying birds. Um, well, funnily enough, the peregrine falcon hits speeds coming down so it it dives down to to attack prey but and this is interesting one of the fastest birds flying just in a straight line is actually a dove a dove flies incredibly quickly in a straight line but obviously with those falcons coming down and hitting speeds and they i think it's i'm trying to think but i think they hit speeds of somewhere around 300 kilometers an hour now what that is in miles i, I can't i don't know uh what is that probably about 180 miles an hour what do you think vm somewhere around there M more i'm not sure I, I, I struggle to convert the miles into kilometers and that but i think it's just over 300 kilometers an hour which is which is incredibly fast incredibly fast Maybe it's maybe somewhere around 200 miles an hour, somewhere around there. Well, 180 miles an hour, I think. I think that's it. I don't know. <laughs> now it all makes sense. 
to, to Edwards was saying, I've, <laughs> I've been caught out because the question was, <laughs> it was not a serious question. It was from a Monty Python skit and now it all makes sense because I've seen the skit and they, <laughs> they talk about it swallow, an unladen swallow. And I think if I'm not mistaken, the swallows carry the coconuts and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, I tried my best to stay professional and answer the question. I couldn't get it, but yeah, I do remember that skit now. My <laughs> I wonder which Monty Python was it? Was it the quest for the Holy Grail? Um, can you remember, have you? Yeah, it was the Grail. It was the quest for the Holy Grail, I think, yeah. <laughs> An unladen swallow. Yeah, that's it. I do remember. I do. <laughs> oh, good old Monty Python. Oh dear. Now, um, a friend of mine that uh, works, still works at uh, Londolozzi, in fact. Um, him, James, and myself uh, to an extent, but initially when James was still working with us at Londolozzi, James and this friend of ours, Duncan, they used to do a skit. Um, now, we we love British comedy and that, and Faulty Towers is obviously right up there with one of the really, really funny uh, comedy shows. And, um, and they would do the skit on, uh, on a... Basically, we, we kind of took part of it from from faulty towers and we adjusted it slightly so and when james left then i filled the role of manuel um obviously and duncan looks very much like john cleese and he can pull off john cleese very well so we would do the skit where john cleese or well, um, basil and manuel are in the hotel um and but we arrive in the boma with all the guests so all the guests would be eating dinner and then we would uh, attempt to clean clear the plates and clear the dinner once the guests have finished and as you can imagine it was very very funny and it was very entertaining for a lot of guests and we used to have a lot of fun in the bombers and James would play guitar we'd sing um, we, do, we, do, we used to do so many fun things and we all worked together it was really great you can imagine the guests loved it and it was just a wonderful experience I do think it's important when you're on safari is you need to have fun uh, it's uh, you know I, I sh try my best to stress that with with guests that i have when i take them out it's obviously we're here for the game viewing and we here to see animals but also sitting around fires in the evening the atmosphere the fun i'm i'm a strong believer in that i think it's um, it's what makes africa so wonderful and i think it adds to the um uh, the, the, the romantic side of Africa, I think there's, you know, it, it really does. Oh, look at the baby Nyala. Hang on. There it goes. Just through there, you might see it. Oh, sorry, those branches are in the way now. The mother's on its way. Maybe it decides to come out. very shy so there he goes the female is coming into frame now and again just look how different these females or this female is compared to that those males that we saw earlier this morning completely different but beautiful beautiful antelope I'm sure there are some more around it's unlikely to find one in Yala by herself with a with a little lamb oh, isn't that nice yeah, so as I was saying, I think, you know, having fun and trying to enjoy the evenings around the fires and um, and what, whatever it is, even on, on safari, on game drive, you know, have fun and enjoy it and laugh and I think it's very important. I do think it's important. to laugh about that swallow. <laughs> oh dear, I can't believe I didn't pick up on that. Oh, 
a slender mongoose. Slender mongoose just ran across the road. I'm going to see if I can. S there it is. There it is. Straight ahead. It's standing up at the moment. Can you see it there, Vian? There. Look at that. There we go. We've been trying to get a view of a slender mongoose. Fantastic. We caught a glimpse of one yesterday. There we go. And then it runs off. But at least we got to see it. Fantastic. You see, I turned and stood up to have a look. I wonder if it was perhaps looking at a bird or something behind it. Let's have a look. Let's just see. But did you see how it stood up to have a look? Really awesome. I, was, I mean, was it yesterday, I think? You know, we had birds alarm calling and chasing a mongoose. We tried to see it and it disappeared. They do disappear fairly quickly. Let's just see if we can't find out. It might be hiding in this little thicket. Uh, no, there it goes, there it goes. Oh, there, the tail up. Oh, hang on, VM. Back into the thicket. They run from thicket to thicket. Little tufts of grass, and I just heard they... Uh, hear the rattling cysticula calling. Uh, there it goes. Oh no, there's Franklin's moving through there. There it goes. Oh, quick little glimpse again. But you see, as it runs, the birds alarm call and they don't like having the mongoose around. And the reason is these mongoose do raid nests. They'll go and look for chicks and eggs. So those birds like to chase those uh, slender mongoose away. Mongoose. Slender mongoose, not mongoose. Slender mongooses. That's the plural for mongoose believe it or not. Let me just... Let's just have a look. I'm trying to see the slender mongoose and see they, you know, insects and, but also reptiles, small rodents, birds. So that's why those birds alarm call at them all, all the time. So they've got a wide variety of food that they feed on, but, um, but they do raid nests and that's exactly why birds always mob the slender mongoose if they do see them, try and chase them away. That was a wonderful sighting of one. Really, really great. Nice surprise. Well, we're doing a lot better this morning in terms of finding animals than I did yesterday afternoon. Now all I need to do is start the car. There we go. Yeah, I hope you all enjoyed that, seeing that mongoose too. It sounds like you all did. Because it's not something we see often. That's great. It just shows you. You never know what's going to pop out and um, show face, shall we say. Is it black backed puff back? I'm trying to say that five times fast. See if I can see it for you. I could just hear it calling. Uh, just have a look around here quickly. It is a beautiful little bird. Otherwise, I'll just show you a picture of one. Hmm. But they do puff their backs up. But. What I'll, <laughs> I'll show you is very interesting, and I don't know why they call it the black back puffback, because the back is in fact white when it puffs it up. So have a look at that. That is the bird that I heard calling, and it's got that wonderful call where it sounds like it's going. <whistles> oh, there we go. So. That's the black back puffback, beautiful bird with a white back that puffs up. Now, um, we're going to continue. It sounds like James is still on the walk. I was worried about him, didn't know what had happened to him. But he's got a surprise visitor in a tree. Let's go have a look. While you've been gone, we've lost signal, but we've had the best time I have ever had on foot in the wild. Over there, in the tree, is Shongile. 
She is 30 feet from us. When we found her, and I say we, Chandra spotted her, she was 100 feet away, and she is, uh, we sat down, and she slowly come closer and closer and closer, and then she climbed this tree behind us. <laughs> and there she's sitting, just watching. She's watching Aubrey, she, her eyes flick to Aubrey, and then to Jandre, and then to me. And she's calling every so often, she's making a little kind of bird-like chirp, which I suppose is perhaps trying to call her mum, or maybe her brother. Hosanna is around here somewhere. Now we're sitting exactly where Shungile and Karula were yesterday, where they killed that little impala lamb, and they finished it. Now let's just see what happens. I'm not going to move. I'm going to sit dead still. I think she's bored, everyone. I think she's just trying to have a conversation. She's curious. We did a little Facebook Live from here. We tried to get a little kind of Facebook Live going because we were hoping, or we were desperate that we should be able to share this with you. Can you hear her calling you? I don't know if you can hear her calling. Now, Karula is off on the far eastern boundary. Of course, she's on a Diker kill. She'll come back here at some stage to fetch Shungile and hopefully Hosanna as well. But in the meantime, this curious young cat is having a conversation with us. And I was trying to unpack what I felt about this. I was trying to unpack what it meant to me and why this was so special. And it's because this animal is not tame. She's not domesticated in any way. She is, in some way, she's an embodiment of wild. She's an embodiment of what it is to be in the wilderness. And that she has chosen to come and have this interaction with us gives us, I suppose, if not a view, it allows us almost to touch the heart of the wilderness. Now that might sound like a complete load of gobbledygook to many of you, but I don't know how else to explain why this is so special, why it's so much more special than when we're in a vehicle. It, we had an incredible sighting of her here yesterday, but this, this is, <laughs> this takes it to a thousand different levels. Even Aubrey, who's seen more leopards than you and I have had hot breakfasts, is sitting here smiling and enjoying this little leopard so close to us. <laughs> and of course, we're sitting here with a young leopard, and I'm, I know Brent has spoken about it, and I'm sure Jamie has too, uh, and Byron probably as well. They've spoken about how they enjoy being with young leopards like this on foot. And James, your question is, will she remain like this? And the answer is almost certainly not. You don't really want her to. When they become adults, they lose that sense of curiosity and awe. What we do want is for her to be comfortable with people on foot so that when we track her as an adult, she isn't afraid and she will just go about her business and that will make viewing her eat more easy. But if we see Karula on foot, she tends to slink away and if she doesn't slink away, she'd never approach you in a curious fashion. So we found her sort of a hundred feet from where we're sitting now. If it had been Karula, she'd just have stayed exactly where she was. I don't think she would have moved off because we sat down immediately and just remained very still and quiet and spoke in these calming tones that I'm speaking in now. But that curiosity that these young leopards have will eventually dissipate as they become adults. She's bored. There's no question she's bored of lying there on her own. That's why she's chosen to come and have a conversation with us. I mean, I cannot believe this. I'm sitting 30 feet from the base of the tree that that leopard's sitting in. Is she coming down now? Let's see if she comes closer still. <laughs> Now when we started, 
she was very careful not to come out into the open like she's doing now. Now, I want to turn, but I'm not going to turn while she's watching me. I'm just going to very slowly move around. I think she likes the sight of Aubrey. She's going around to see what he's, he's like. And you still see her, Jandri? No. Okay, she's just the other side of the tree. She's now moving away. Yeah, she's moving away from us now. If you want to stand, John, stand now slowly. We're going to try and get one last look. No, she's gone. She's gone into the thicket. All right, um, we're going to head back to Brent and his mystery leopard. I will tell you, for those of you who were watching yesterday, you may have noticed that William of Juma lost his hat. We found it again. William will be very happy. I am absolutely ecstatic. So we've managed to catch up with this leopard and the debate continues. I think I've been trying to look at pictures of uh, both Shadow and Tandy, but I think it might be Shadow. I just don't think I've seen her in so long that she, she confused me. And also, it doesn't help that all my photographs of, uh, that I have here of Tandy seem to be of her snarling. But yeah, Shadow is a 3 4, and Tandy's a 3 3. And you have one picture of Tandy not snarling. Now, as you can see, she's right in the base of a little dry riverbed. And they see that's on the right, so that should be a, a three. Oh, it's such a pity that little jackalberry is in the way. If we go back a little bit, I think we might see her spot pattern. <laughs> there we go. As you can see the three. Big first spot. Let's have a look. Where is Shadow? Big first spot. It looks to be sort of the right shape. Let me go back to Tandy now. Oh dear. I think it is. It is Shadow. Shadow, is that you? Scott of you? She's very full. <laughs> Ooh, we're gonna come back just now, but Bry Byron's got an incredible bird to show you. How beautiful is this, a squawker heron. That is what this is, and that is breeding plumage at the moment. A beautiful color, that rufous and white, and there is a lot of streaking on the head. This is a beautiful squawker heron. And they are wonderful. They are um, they're common residents, uh, however, they they usually found singly and you don't see them very often i must be honest i think and i'm just trying to think now but this is the first time i've actually seen a squawker heron um properly i think i caught a glimpse of one once south of here but but uh, couldn't really count it this is uh, the first proper sighting i've had of a squawker heron which is wonderful it's always great to see these new birds, but that is, I mean, out in the open, they do tend to enjoy reeds quite a lot, but out in the open and to see that beautiful plumage. 
Now the head does extend a little bit at times. Um, it has got a longer neck, and I'll show you a picture of one with its neck extended out. But um, but when they do sit, they pull their necks in. And that's a view that you get. So just quickly, let's have a look here. I'll just show you. That's an adult over there with the, the neck extended. Not a big heron, not like the Goliath or the grey heron that we do see around these areas quite regularly. But it is a beautiful small heron to see. Wow, Aaron, your list is on 143 already. And this uh, with the squawker heron, great, a new bird for you too, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, you know, so they, um, I mean, they feed on frogs and fish and, and even aquatic uh, insects that you might find around here. But that is really a really great sighting. I've enjoyed this morning, seen some interesting new little creatures around, well, not, ne not really new, but uh, some nice sightings of the things that we don't get to see often, like that slender mongoose and um, and the squawker heron. Scanning around to see if there's anything else. All right, well, it's great that we could show you the squawker heron. Let's head back to Brent and the leopard and get an update from him. Okay, I'm still indecisive about which leopard this possibly is. I, I'm, I'm leaning a little bit more towards shadow now. Why don't you guys let me know? You've got all those wonderful screenshots and you can go back and double check. Which leopard is this? Is this Tandy or shadow? I think it's probably shadow. I mean, we are in what would be considered the core of shadow's territory, or in Juma at least. So why don't you guys let me know, because I'm fresh out of guesses. You, Byron? Brian? Byron? Brian? Too many bees? I don't know. You don't know? Not sure? who says he's a relative newbie and would like to know how we identify a spot patterns. Well, Mike, it will be my absolute pleasure uh, to, to help you out with that. Now, you see there's a, a line of spots just above her last line of whiskers. And that is, each leopard has a, a very different one. I'm just gonna I'm probably going to use a different leopard to the ones we think this is just because I think there's a better picture and it'll be easier to discern. Okay, we're getting there, we're getting there. I know, I've got lots of close-ups of leopards and I'm just finding the right one to show you. Anyway, that, that, should, that should do just for these... Oh, no, no, what have I done? I've pushed a button and there we go, that's the picture we want. So, here we go, Mike. We're talking about this line of spots there. So, the last line of spots, so he said the last whiskers. So, this is actually quarantine, and on the right, he's got one, two, three, four spots. And it's like a little fingerprint. Each individual leopard has a slightly different pattern. Let's have a look if we can see another one quickly. Uh, Mr. Tingana. So there we go. He's one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. So there we go. 
So each leopard, it's it's like a little fingerprint, and uh, each individual leopard's got one. From what I can see through here, but we can't really see too well because she is slightly obscured. I think it is shadow. Uh, it would make sense. Uh, in this area, we do find her, or have found her historically quite a lot in this area. But she's eaten half an impala baby, and now she's having a schnooze. I don't think she's going to move too much from here. And I think we'll probably leave her be. I don't think she's going to go back where that she's put the kill is nearly impossible to get to. We can just make it out from the distance. But Brian's going to show you now. I mean, what's there? It's there. It's under there somewhere in that mass of thickets. Okay, Miss Shadow. I'm pretty sure it's Shadow. Guys, you can confirm with me, but I think we'll leave her here. We're not going to get much more out. I think she's got such a full belly. All she wants to do is snooze. And we're going to go meander about and see what else uh, we can find. So apparently most of you do think it's Shadow. I think I got a little bit excited. I always get excited when I think we found a new leopard. But... Um, It is wonderful to catch up with her. I haven't seen Shadow in an absolute age. And uh, now we're going to leave her here snoozing in the drainage line. And while we do that, James has got a pretty flower to show you. I'm still sort of in a bit of a funk, everybody, about the experience we've just had, I must say. Every time I blink, all I see is Shongile's brown eyes boring into me from the top of her tree. Marvellous. Right, this flower over here is called Gushu. And we've mentioned it before, but uh, at the time I didn't know what it was. And Judy H helped me identify it. And Herbert helped me identify it. And it is edible. You can use this as a kind of a spinach. Um, I don't really feel like spinach, I feel like um, champagne after that, so I'm not going to eat the gushu this time. And the reason the yellow flowers, which are quite pretty, they, well, they're not very big, but they're very pretty. The reason they're not at the moment open is because, of course, we don't have any sun. And we are not sad about that. I know for many of you, especially those of you who are experiencing winter, the thought of having a cloudy, miserable grey day would be horrible for us after yesterday's volcanic temperatures. The sight of these clouds is something of a relief. Now we are making our way sort of slowly around back towards home. I'm going to help Jandre stand up now. Unfortunately, he's managed to detach himself from his backpack. Here you are, Jandre. Oh, there, I see. Okay, hang on. I see what you've done, sort of. Is this the right one? Yes. yes. We're just going to try and sort of tie him back into his, uh, into his backpack. You see, he's also lost his mind after that leopard sighting. Really too special for words. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'm sorry you weren't with us for a little bit longer for it. We enjoyed that leopard. She sat with us, you know, for about half an hour, which I think is just astounding. Jean-Ré, your stomach's growling. I don't ever want to be this close to you. I found it distasteful. Right, there you go. Up you get. Well done. Okay. Okay, oh, I'm wearing two hats. I, I, forgot, I forgot about that. <laughs> Come on then, let's go and see what else is through here in the last few minutes of our drive. So it's interesting, so that's Shadow. So we've seen Karula and Shadow and Shongila today, all the ladies. We think, we think maybe um, Hosanna has gone down into the drainage line over there. And that's certainly to the direction that she went. When Aubrey last heard on the radio, Karula was on her way here, and she was at Twin Dams Road, and that's not too far from where we were, and we were all wondering what would have happened if Karula had come towards us while we were sitting there with her daughter at just 10 meters. And Aubrey reckoned that what she'd start to do was call, probably about 30 or 40 meters away, so um, say up to 100 feet away, she would have, 150 feet, she'd have started calling, and chuffing, and Shongile then would have melted away and gone back to her mum. So I don't think that we were ever in any danger of Karula getting upset with us, um, but I think probably best not to test that theory. Right, on we go. <laughs> it's just, 
I really I'm struggling to stop smiling after that quite astounding sighting. I was also hoping that they, I, clearly my predictions were absolute rubbish. I said that she was going to hang around quarantine because of all the impala lambs. That's clearly absolute nonsense. Yet again, nature has proved me completely incompetent at predicting what it's going to do. Oh well, tough. Now, let's have one last look over here and see if we can't unearth some sort of insect. Oh, hang on a second, there's actually something much more interesting. See here, Jondry, I'll pick this to you so you don't have to get down. This is an unusual plant in this area. Don't know if it's used medicinally at all. Why is it unusual, Jondry? It's a fan. Oh, I'm very sad that you've figured that out. It is, as it says, you probably didn't hear it is a fern. Now ferns of course are normally associated with fairly wet mossy forested areas but in this area we have a like this. Anyway our signal is dying slightly. I'm going to carry the fern with me. Let's head across to Byron and see what he's got. So we've been Driving around, we went past the Gallagher waterhole um, just to see if there was anything there. Unfortunately, not. I've still been chuckling about that uh, <laughs> Monty Python skit. Uh, Tracy and Trip Edwards, thank you very much for that entertainment this morning. I did enjoy that. You got, you got me really good, Tracy. <laughs> Enjoy that. That's right up my alley when it comes to sense of humor. Oh, hang on. Oh, what are these? The green, green wood hoopers. There's one sitting off to the left in the tree. Let's see if it stays there. Oh, obviously it flew away. And there goes the other one. Very quickly, green wood hoopoo. With that beautiful bright red beak. We've seen quite a few of them around. Show you a picture quickly for those of you who haven't seen them. I can hear the others calling. Let's see if we can find them. Uh, have you got them there? Have you? Uh, oh, they're behind us now. Typical. <laughs> Hang on. Let's quickly see if we can get these sitting in this tree. In there, you might get them there, Vim. Can you see them jumping around there? There they are, the green wood hoopers. Difficult to see the colours. There they go. Try to find them quickly for you, just show you exactly how colorful they are. Uh, what can I find? There we go. There we go. And that'll give you a better idea of the color of that bird. A beautiful, beautiful coloration. And when the light hits them, you see that iridescence, but that green, I mean that red beak, it's very easy to see. And they are always in groups, family groups. And that's exactly what we have around here. We've got a few of them dotted around and they're all calling at the moment. Nice to see them. It's been quite a leopard morning this morning. I mean, we had James. James found leopard on foot. Uh, Shungile. Was it Shungile? Yeah, it was Shungile apparently. 
Um, and then, um, and then Brent got to see that female leopard early on this morning, and then another leopard a little bit later. So we've been very fortunate with leopard sightings this morning. Bushmike, you wanted to know if that green wood hoopoe is the same as the red billed wood hoopoe. Exactly the same. That's just the old name. Um, now, interestingly enough, I was chatting, was chatting to another guide. Oh, here's some impala lambs running around. Let's have a look. Just off to the right. Now, now this is interesting, and I, I'd actually like some of the, the the viewers' input on this, and I'm curious as to what you think. We refer to the bird names and the and we say, oh, these are the new names or these are the old names, um, and and we try and give you as many of the names as possible. The the names changed and most of them changed. I'm trying to think if it was the early 2000s, I think, because I remember 2003, 2004, the names had already begun to change and they were changing and. Um, now, I spoke to someone the other day, and um, and we were discussing the new names, and we said, and he made quite a valid point. He said, for guides these days, not to know the new name is 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 completely wrong, I think, and and that's what he thought too, because he said these names have changed and they've changed so many years ago. The, that is the name of the bird now. So the the old name, some people who are still stuck on the old names, I think with the birding it's different. I think it's it's time that perhaps everybody needs to get on the same page with the with the new names. It is difficult at times, and I catch myself occasionally. Um, another example is the um, violet-backed starling. The old name is the plum-colored starling. It's a beautiful name, plum-colored starling. It's got beautiful colors, but it's called a violet-backed starling now. So, you know, I, I kind of get where that this other guy was making a point. He said, you know, we now at a stage where we should purely be using those new names and um, and perhaps we can say look it used to be called that but that that is the name and um, we can't uh, deny using the, the the new names because that's what they called so I'm curious just uh, out of intersect what viewers think about that are you happy with the new uh, the changes uh, but like I said I mean it happened so many years ago we've got to just accept it and move on and learn the new names and then if you know the old names it's interesting to know and there's a lilac breasted roller that's been calling making quite a harsh noise i can't see it at the moment but anyway we've had a wonderful morning i hope you've all enjoyed it with us so from myself and vm thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening wherever you are in the world we're going to head back to van hunk and see what he has got Hey guys, welcome back. What a splendid morning. It did start off a little on the, the slow side, but we got to talk about Van Hunk and his smoking habit. And uh, of course, uh, we got to see Karula, not the greatest sighting of Karula, and then Shadow, and it's Shongile on foot with James. What an incredible morning. Now, I just want to touch on one thing that I, I got sidetracked by leopards. It was birding capitals of the world. Now, James is spot on. Costa Rica is definitely one of the birding capitals of the world. Uh, in Africa, you gotta look at the Congo Basin forests. Uh, and there's about 1,600 species that occur in the Congo. But for in terms of, like Costa Rica, a small country with the most incredibly diverse bird life, and it actually has more uh, than Costa Rica, which I found quite amazing, is Uganda. Uganda, 1,100 species of birds. So by far, most definitely, the birding capital of Africa has to be Uganda. And if you look at the whole of Southern Africa, that's Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, South Africa, only 950 species, Botswana alone, 550. So it, it, is, it is all dependent. So I would definitely say Uganda, for a country of its size, is the birding capital of Africa.
uh, Lucy is saying, why do they give birds new names? Weren't the old ones good enough? Well, Lucy, it's actually reverting to the oldest name. So what's happened is ornithologists and bird watchers throughout Africa uh, have been calling birds by different names. So, for example, what we call a blue waxbill was called a blue cordon bleu. What we call a batelier was called a short-tailed eagle and it created a bit of confusion amongst bird watchers and safari goers so the old ornithological lot they got together and they reverted back to the first name that it was ever called by so a batelier stayed a batelier the and a lot of things have changed but the one that is the funniest for me is of course the cordon bleu it is the one east africa will not give up even though wax balls were described before cordon bleus those kenyans will not give up the cordon bleu it is a blue cordon bleu and it's a blue wax ball but other than that they've all reverted to the last or the first name they were ever ever referred to as so well from the killer bees, killer bees. two leopards today yes how many leopards yesterday? Was it was it three? Oh, yeah. oh just checking. And the not so blue time Monday thumb with a smiley face. It's been great being with you. We'll see you soon. But let's go across to the highly entertaining Commander Bond on foot. Now, let me finish my fascinating fern story, everybody. I know that you've all been sitting on the edge of your seats thinking, what is he going to tell us about that fascinating plant that he found? Right, well here it is. I still have it with me. And it's now wilting slightly. It's a not very impressive little fern anymore, is it? Anyway, a fern, everybody, like I said, likely to grow far more in forest and mossy areas than it would in a kind of dry, semi-arid area like this. And they breed, of course, completely differently from the angiosperms or gymnosperms, depending on which plant you have. In other words, the flowering plants. And normally they will produce spores. Oh, I'm not going to make you look at that. Um, well, you can't see them there. On the back of the leaves they produce spores. They don't produce flowers and seeds like the flowering plants do. The spores are on the back of the leaves and they then get tossed to the wind. And these ones, I think, grow parasitically on the rootstock, often of cambritum trees like this one over here. Now, that's enough of the fern. There is a tortoise, and jean -Dre and I, along with, um, I think it was Herbert, a little while back, found six or seven of these tortoises eaten together. And here are another two. Both of them have been devoured. Uh, probably, I suspect, they spent their time in around, and around this termite mound during the winter. They probably came out fairly recently, and I suspect a badger of having at them. It's bitten off the kind of softish bit there, and I think that's what's eaten them. All right, everyone, that is going to be it from us today. We have had the most wonderful, wonderful experience on foot with Shongile. I'm sad you didn't join us for all of it, but at least we got some of it. We'll see you this afternoon at four o'clock. Until then, stay safe and happy, and thank you very, very much for joining us on the walk and two drives. I hope you've enjoyed it half as much as we have.